Thank you all for being here this morning. Um, a hot summer morning in Charlotte. I'm grateful to see everyone. Um, and thank you to the folks who are joining us on Zoom. We have a wonderful and uh, full hour ahead of us this morning. And today marks a shift in our summer education and in our summer Sunday school focus. We have spent a few weeks talking about um, the idea and Christian practice of discernment. And today we shift our focus to the idea and Christian practice of Sabbath. We will do so by hearing from a friend and guest um, who I'll introduce in just a moment, but I'd first like to open us in a word of prayer. So would you please join me in prayer? Gracious God, with curious minds and ever-growing spirits, we gather together this morning, excited to learn, eager to grow in both faith and in community. So fill this room with your spirit, make wide our hearts to receive what it is you have in store for us today, and delight us with your grace. Through Christ we pray. Amen. Here to ground us this morning in a biblical understanding of Sabbath is Dr. Brennan Breed, Assistant Professor of Old Testament at Columbia Theological Seminary. Um, he was one of my professors at Columbia and has been with Covenant um, a few times. He was here last summer to help us in our understanding of Christian hospitality, and we had such a good time that we thought we'd have him back. I recently clicked over to Columbia's website and found this great reflection of yours, Dr. Breed, about your own discernment and journey um, to becoming a professor in the particular um, area that you are. And you wrote about wanting to dedicate your life to learning to read the Bible, um, to teaching about it with a deep conviction that the Bible speaks to our contemporary world both diagnosing many of our ills and offering an alternative path of generative liberation and true peace. I love that. And we look forward today to learning about how the Bible speaks to our contemporary understanding of Sabbath. And we so appreciate you being here. Following Dr. Breed's lecture and presentation, we'll have a little bit of time for Q&A. There are some slips of paper on your table, so feel free to jot down anything that comes up for you, and we'll collect those um, at the end of the lecture and have a time for Dr. Breed to respond. So with that, would you please join me in welcoming Dr. Brennan Breed. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you all for being here. Uh, thank you for the invitation. Uh, thanks to Mary Kate and, uh, and the crew here at, at Covenant uh, for inviting me. I uh, love speaking at churches uh, in part just to be around folks uh, that can nerd about by the Bible in the same way I can. Um, but also, uh, you know, it's a Sunday morning. Uh, it's, you know, fairly early, depending on your age and your, you know, uh, activity in life. Um, but nonetheless, this, we, we all got up this morning and we all got ready and we all came out here and we all want to learn about God together. Um, this to me, uh, is not only a wonderful example of Sabbath, but it's a wonderful thing for me to want to be a part of. So thank you for inviting me. I really appreciate it. Um, so I teach at Columbia Theological Seminary, uh, as you've heard, um, and, uh, uh, like you, uh, I, uh, uh you know, am, happy in many ways uh, to show up to church on Sunday, but also there are days, I don't know if you felt like this every once in a while, where you wake up and you say, ah. you like look outside your window and you see someone just kind of rocking on their porch, you know, and porch swing or on their chair or whatever. And then you kind of look at them and they're like, ah, just drinking their coffee in their pajamas. And you see somebody like riding their bike by, and you see somebody like, I don't know, flying a kite across the street. And you think, oh gosh, do I... Do I really want to, I don't know, go to church? Uh, this is the way that many of us think about Sabbath, right? It's the church day. It's the time that we go to church. And that's what most other people think about Sabbath, if they think about it at all. Or, or perhaps they encounter the Sabbath mainly through blue laws, right? Uh, it's the day when you can't buy liquor until noon in, in Atlanta. That's how many of my friends in Atlanta who don't go to church tend to think about the Sabbath. Uh, so the question for us today is, um, what is the Sabbath actually? Uh, why in the world do we have this thing? Is it really important? Uh, is it something more than just going to church um, or maybe like not buying alcohol before noon uh, at a grocery store or something? Um, my conviction and my hope for the next hour is that 
we not only learn a little bit about the Bible and about Sabbath, but um, that we see that this is actually a crucial linchpin for our faith, that Sabbath practice is not just showing up to church, but it's a complete way to rewire our faith, our life, our minds, our hearts, our souls, that this is the key to a Christian spiritual practice, that it was and remains the key to a Jewish spiritual practice as well. So we're going to spend some time looking at some Old Testament texts uh, that will help us think about Sabbath. So this word Sabbath, uh, Shabbat uh, in Hebrew, it really means to stop. And it can mean to stop anything. It can mean like, you know, you, I've got two kids, 14 and 12. So we sometimes, you know, we're about to go on a long car trip to go visit family. I imagine there'll be some poking, you know, stop, stop it. You know, get, ah, gosh, you know, or like, this is the line and don't, you know, don't, don't get it. Don't cross over. Right. Um, no, they're, they're sweet kids, but uh, you know, on long car trips, we all go a little bit crazy. Um, but this idea of just stopping, just stopping anything. This is what that word means to cease, to stop Shabbat. And the question is to stop what? We also associate this in Jewish and Christian tradition with rest, that there's a stopping, and we'll see what that stopping is about. Uh, it's, it's really about work, to stop work. So what is work is a big question, right? But it's also about resting, to stop and to rest. I love this image. This is um, from a Slavonic Bible. This is a Middle Ages uh, illuminated manuscript. That's, you know, some Cyrillic you can see up there, uh, that language. Uh, but you can see uh, that this is God sleeping. This is the illumination for the seventh day of creation, um, which should seem a little strange to us, right? That God sleeps, that God gets tired. No, I mean, God doesn't sleep. Jesus slept, but, you know, God the Father, right, does not sleep, right, doesn't need sleep. God doesn't really need rest, this picture of God sleeping, I think, is just amazing. Um, but also, this is actually what, yes, God rested. God stopped. God stopped for a moment. Uh, before I move on, let me just say this. I kind of always say this at the beginning of speaking at any church I ever speak at. Um, and that's uh, the Bible was written to a specific people, or actually a few different specific groups of people, a long time ago. Uh, and my conviction is that God speaks to people in ways that they can understand. This is part of what incarnation, I think, means, is that God actually became enfleshed in the person of Jesus, but had to pick a particular culture to be a part of, a particular group of people. God spoke in the person of Jesus a particular language. Uh, God spoke with the limitations of that human language. And when Jesus had to make a point, Jesus had to say something, you know, in Aramaic slash Hebrew, Aramaic, Hebrewish. Um, Jesus had to say something in that specific culture that would make sense to those people at the time. They weren't of unlimited brain power. They were regular people like you and me. So when God speaks to us, God has to speak in ways that make sense to us or that make sense to people in a particular culture at a particular time, which means we sometimes need to think about that. We need to translate. And the, the Christian tradition really is a tradition of translation. Um, most other religious traditions that have a sacred text, they say you actually have to read it in that original language for it to make a lot of sense. Uh, so in Jewish tradition, they read a lot of Torah in Hebrew as part of the rituals, uh, as part of the ceremonies of, of, the, of the religion. Same thing with Islam, right? Everyone reads the Quran in Arabic. And they say the translation is actually not very good. Uh, you're not supposed to really read it in translation. The, the original is, is the real one. Um, I work in original languages, that is to say Hebrew and Greek and Aramaic, and I think it's really wonderful, and we need to teach that, and there need to be people who learn this. But a basic conviction of the Christian faith is that our faith is translatable, and that Jesus' words are translatable. In fact, the Gospels only have a couple of words in the original language that Jesus spoke, Aramaic, Hebrew, slash you know, Aramaic, um, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, right? Jesus said on the cross. Uh, there's only a few snippets like that because it was written instead in Koine Greek. The New Testament was written in a business language, kind of like business English, this kind of language that everyone in that world had a few words of and that many people had to learn a lot of, but it was no particular person's culture, Koine Greek. Um, it was this kind of international language of communication. Uh, and it's in that space of communication that the New Testament was written. 
So that is to say, the first words of Jesus that we encounter, like the, the rock bottom of Jesus that we can get to is actually already in a different language. And that's okay, that's good. Early Christians said, this is okay. This is, a, this is the religion of Pentecost, right? We are in part of a, a movement that's trying to translate these, these words and these phrases. But it also means that we get more out of biblical texts when we pay attention to this culture into which God spoke. So that's why I might, you know, say things like Shabbat, what's that original word mean and things like this. And this kind of cultural context in which Israel lived was this culture of the ancient Near East, we might call it, or ancient Southwest Asia and Egypt. Uh, I don't know, there's tons of different ways to talk about this. The Levant is another word, just meaning the, the Eastern coastline of the Mediterranean Sea. All those phrases are fine, but like the Fertile Crescent's another one, just this kind of area that you can see behind me in green. Um, all these cultures were related uh, they all were all linguistically related. They were all culturally related. They shared a lot of stories and information. It's kind of like how, I don't know, the, in the U.S., like everyone watches, everyone watches the same movies, right? We might have different cultures. That is to say the culture of Seattle might be really different from Charlotte, but there's a lot of connection. You all can communicate with each other. Um, that's the same thing about, say, Israel and Egypt or Israel and Mesopotamia. These stories were everywhere. Uh, and one of these stories I'll get to in just a moment um, was about creation. Uh, there was kind of a shared creation story in the ancient world around Israel. Now, uh, if you were here last summer and heard me talk, you'll we'll talk about some of the same texts, um, but we're going to come at them from a little bit of a different angle. Uh, if you're reading the Bible, um, you might open up to the first page. That's Genesis, Genesis 1, right? Um, and it's a story about creation. Uh, we actually get two creation stories to kick off the Bible, Genesis 1 and then Genesis 2. Um, but the Genesis 1 creation story goes all the way to verse four, or actually the middle of verse four. So chapter one, verse one of Genesis to chapter two, verse four, a, a meaning just the first half of the verse. That's our first creation story in the Bible. There's actually more creation stories in the Bible. Uh, Job 38 is a good creation story. Uh, Psalm 104 is a really good creation story. Uh, Proverbs 8 verses 22 to 31 is another creation story, and they're all a little different. This creation story in Genesis 1, all the way from verse 1 to chapter 2, verse 4, that creation story is built in a very specific way, and it's built to culminate at an amazing moment, something that would have been shocking to the people of the ancient world. Now, there's lots of things that are shocking about this uh, creation story, um, or at least it would have been in the ancient world. Today, people just hear it and say, oh gosh, how boring. Um, but it would have been a bombshell in the ancient world for a few different reasons. Um, one of the things that would have made this creation story a bombshell was the statement in chapter one, verse 26, that God said, let us make humankind in our image, according to our likeness. And that doesn't mean we look exactly like God and God's got a nose and, and hair. That didn't, that didn't mean that in the ancient world either. Um, uh, this, this really has to do with kind of like a, how God is, like the, the way God acts. We are kind of like God in the things we can do, the way we can act, that we can love, we can cry, uh, we can hate, uh, we can, you know, God, God says God dislikes things very strongly in the Bible too. That is to say we emotionally, mentally, we have some similarities to God. Uh, but this is all humankind, every single person who has ever lived. This would have been a really interesting statement in the ancient world that every single person who had ever lived was all made together in the image of God. There's a fundamental equality for all people, no matter where they come from, no matter what hierarchy, the part of the hierarchy they were born into, if you told an Egyptian that Pharaoh was fundamentally the same thing as a Semitic slave that was being told to build the pyramids, right? You know, they would have said, "No, that's ridiculous. Uh, that's that's impossible, right? Pharaoh's God stuff, and the people we've enslaved are eh, subhuman, and most of the Egyptians are kind of in the middle somewhere." But to say every single person that you've ever met, you ever will meet, is something like a copy of God. That's radical, fundamentally radical in the ancient world. We'll get back to this point. Uh, but then one of the other things that would have been really strange is that at the end of the story, God stops. and just kind of hangs out for a while. So this is the part, we usually talk about the six days of creation. Have you anyone ever heard the six days of creation? Well, it's not six days. It's a seven-day story. It's about the week, right? But that seventh day, we often skip and in fact, early readers of the Bible who ended up putting in the chapter numbers, chapter numbers didn't, you know, Moses didn't hear the chapter numbers from God, right? Um, chapter numbers were added in the 12th or early 13th century by Stephen Langton, the Archbishop of Canterbury. 
around the year 1204. So uh, this, this guy added in the chapter numbers. They're often, you know, interesting to take a note of. Oftentimes they are pretty good about telling us when, a, you know, there's a big change in the story or something, but some of them are real wrong and are uh, kind of mislead us. And I think this one is one of the biggest ones. Chapter two begins, thus the heavens and the earth were finished with all their multitude. Oh, okay. So that's the end of creation. Well, no, the heavens and the earth were finished. And on the seventh day, chapter one should, should kind of keep going for a few more verses here. Uh, that first creation story is, isn't done yet. On the seventh day, God finished the work that God had done and God rested. That word in Hebrew, Shabbat, that's Shabbat. And God Shabbated, God rested, God stopped, God ceased. God didn't cease everything, right? God didn't stop anything. God stopped the work. God stopped working. God stopped making new stuff. God had been busy planning the world, putting things in order. And then God said, okay, I'm going to stop that. And then God blessed the seventh day. Ah, God doesn't stop doing everything. God's not falling asleep. God is doing stuff. God's not just not doing the work of creation. God instead now blesses the seventh day. And then God hallowed it. Hallowed be thy name, right? What does hallowed mean? It means holy, to make something holy. And we might think making it holy, that means don't drink on Sundays or, you know, make sure that no one, you know, I don't know, does work on Sunday. No one goes to run a store or something like that. That's hallowing it, right? Um, actually, or like don't curse on Sundays or something. It's okay on Monday, but, you know, Sundays, no. Um, yeah, that's not what hallowing means. Hallowed doesn't have anything. Holy does not have anything to do with good. It doesn't have anything to do with goodness, ethical, moral, religious righteousness. It has nothing to do with that. Righteousness and holiness are related in some ways, but holiness just means set apart for God's special use. There can be bad priests. They're still holy. They're set apart for God's special use. So ancient Israel might have had a bad lampstand. It was made poorly. It was bent, eh, tarnished. But if that lampstand was in the temple, it was holy. It was set apart for God's special use. It's not about goodness. It's just about being set apart. So this day was then set apart for God's special use because on it, God rested, God shabbated, God ceased from all the work that God had done in creation. So we're kind of interpreting the word rest into there, but the word really is stop. So God stopped. Now, one thing to notice is like, what is God doing there? Well, God's blessing and hallowing. But other than that, what's God doing? God is just stopping. This isn't the only time though in Genesis 1 that we've seen God stopping to, I don't know, do something other than create. Every single day that we've seen in the creation cycle so far, God has stopped and done something. So God creates the first day. God creates kind of separating uh, uh, this uh, light and darkness. And then the next day, God separates kind of a dome and yeah, air and so on. You know, and then verse 13, chapter one, verse 13 of Genesis. And there was evening and there was morning the third day. And then God ends up creating more stuff. And then Verse 25, God created all this extra stuff, and then God saw that it was good. And then at the end of the sixth day, verse 31, God saw it was very good. So God is not just creating and then resting all or stopping all on the last day, the seventh day. Instead, God is actually building in a little period of time every day of creation to stop and look around and to see and notice, is it good? So notice that God has built in a little aesthetic appreciation time every single day of creation so far. And then in the last day, God ends up stopping the work entirely. Now, it doesn't say that God said anything was very good on this day, but this might be a little clue about what God is actually doing on this day. God is blessing and hallowing it, and then God is enjoying it. God says, is this good? Oh, it's good. So this is, uh, I think, a, a strange Thing for an ancient person to have heard. Your God stopped and just kind of looked around. So there is no regular day of rest that we know of in ancient Egypt. 
They had festival days that came not on certain days of the week, but came certain days of the year. They had their New Year's Day. They had, right, there were festival days. But a regular built-in weekly rest day, they didn't have. The Babylonians didn't have it. The Syrians didn't have it. And if you think about it, every single one of the patterns of time in Genesis 1 and every single one of the patterns of time that ancient Israelites recognized are built into the cosmos. A day, right? Sun goes down, sun goes up. You're not making that up. Now, when does the day shift from one day to another? We can argue about that. But the sun goes down, the sun comes up, that happens. Uh, a year. It's one revolution around the sun. We didn't make that up. It's actually a big deal in, in cosmological terms, right? Um, you think about like a month. Well, that doesn't have any basis in na nature. It actually does, right? In the ancient world, it's, it's about moon cycles. So every time the moon goes around, then you got a new month. All these things are built into the cosmos, except the week has no correlation to anything having to do with the cosmos. In other words, you wouldn't just make it up. You wouldn't know it. But ancient Israel says, and they're the only ancient people who say this, actually the seven day thing, that's pretty cool. So this is a, a strange, non-natural, right? This is a, a God made or human made, right? Um, a phenomenon. Okay, so this would have seemed strange to these ancient folks in part because of the stories that they had inherited. So ancient Israel was a part of that ancient world in which these stories of creation were popular, were common, were all around the area. Uh, everyone knew these stories. There were different names given to different versions of them, but the ancient creation stories match up. So the ancient Egyptian creation stories, like the Memphite theology is pretty similar to the Babylonian creation stories. It's pretty similar to the Canaanite creation stories. we got a bunch of these and they match up in many different respects. Um, this one right here, this is a cylinder seal. It's like how you'd sign your name. Um, so this is someone's individual picture that they thought was really cool. And this is depicting the creation story in ancient Babylon. Uh, so the Enuma Elish and Atrahasis were two stories of creation from ancient Babylon. Um, they're told from different angles and they disagree about some things, but ultimately uh, both of them were important. The Enuma Elish was read every New Year's Day. So it was read as kind of like a creation New Year. You know, it's, it's a neat sync up. Many uh, ancient cultures did this, we think. But this picture depicts a giant snake thing. I don't know if you can see this, but this is kind of giant snake guy. Uh, and then there's a guy on top holding like, I don't know, what looks like forks or something. Um, uh, but that, that's, a, that, that's a god. Uh, this, is, this is Marduk, the god of Babylon. And he's jumping on top of the, of the chaos snake monster, uh, which was Tiamat. Uh, in Canaanite mythology, this went by the name Leviathan. Might have heard of it, right? So this is the snake monster of chaos that tries to eat up the world. And so the world is built on, and the world's formed by the, the carcass. Like we're walking on the carcass of this chaotic snake monster that the gods defeated and then used to kind of create the world. And then they created humans using part of the snake monster blood, um, but then also dirt. That might seem familiar. Um, and then the gods made this and then they made us to be slaves because the reason there was a fight at the beginning was because like the chaos gods didn't want to do all the work. And there were some like slave gods that didn't want to do the work. So they rebelled and the high gods had to fight them. This is all these different uh, Babylonian creation stories and Canaanite creation stories. I kind of had this part of it. Um, and eventually humans are created so that we do the work so that the gods don't have to do the work. That's why you farm. That's why you bring your food to the temple. That's what your tithe is. It's feeding the gods so that they don't fight with each other so that the world continues. But the whole thing is it's trying to tell you that your job, your whole purpose in life is to produce. This is the point. Your whole purpose in life is to produce. And the reliability of the world's natural cycles, your life and the lives of everyone that you know, is fully dependent on your ability to keep producing. And then you've got to give the lion's share of your produce to the temple so that the gods can eat it so that they don't fight, so that you can survive. Does that make sense? This is the ancient story. Ancient Israelites were taken in captivity to Babylon, right? You know, they, they were hanging out there in Babylon. They heard these stories. And they knew what they were being told. You exist to produce. And the world and God or the gods depend on that. I don't know if you've heard that, but the, that, that, the creation story in Genesis 1 is, I think, designed to counteract these stories. You are not designed just to work. God doesn't need your work. In fact, in Genesis 1, 
the the story goes on like kind of in some weird detail about the seeds that are in the world. I didn't plan on talking about this, but this is actually kind of important. Um, so there's all these seeds. And why does God keep talking about the seeds? So listen, to this. this is from Genesis 1, verse 11. God says, let the earth put forth vegetation, plants yielding seed and fruit trees of every kind on earth that bear fruit with the seed in it. And it was so. The earth brought forth vegetation, plants yielding seed of every kind and trees of every kind bearing fruit with the seed in it. Like, what, what is all this stuff about seeds? Well, if you're an ancient Canaanite, you think that the gods need to be involved in the growing cycle, in the farming cycle, in order for there to be food. Why does it rain? Because Baal, the storm god, makes it rain. What do you have to do for Baal to want to make it rain? You got to bring your produce from last year, right? You got to keep them happy so they keep the cycles working. Dagon was the, the god of grain. Remember that story from 1 Samuel where they take the ark out into battle and it gets captured and the Philistines take it back and they put it in front of the temple of Dagon. And then the next day, like the, the statue fell over. It's kind of a cool story, 1 Samuel 1 through 4. Uh, but this story is all about Dagon, the grain god. Dagon literally means grain. And it just means like he's the grain god. He's the god who brings the grain. So you got to keep him happy. You got to give him a bunch of the grain in order for him to give you the grain. So this is the way that this cycle kind of works in the ancient world. But Genesis 1 goes on and on about the seeds. It's trying to tell you something. God made the world so that things will just grow. You don't have to pray to God for the crops to grow. You can ask God to help and whatever, but you don't need to do it. It will grow because God made it that way. God made the world reliable to a point that it'll, it'll grow stuff. You, and you don't need to know the special name of God to make things grow. And you don't need to bring any produce to the temple to make it grow. It just happens. So uh, this is completely uh, uh, in contradistinction to the way that they're being told, the, these ancient Israelites are being told about their worth, their value, and their purpose. What's their purpose in life? Uh, a great example, kind of counterexample, is found in Exodus. Uh, Exodus 5, so the ancient uh, Israelites go down into um, Egypt. They're enslaved because Pharaoh gets really worried about them, and especially about their power, that they are going to be too strong. So he makes them work, uh, and he enslaves them. And Moses of course, famously gets sent by God to demand that the people need to go. And what is, what are they going to go do? They're going to go and celebrate a festival to their God. That's what Moses keeps telling Pharaoh. We need to go so we can celebrate a festival to our God. You know what that means? Holiday. Now, if you're a boss, you got a lot of people working for you and you're under a deadline and then a holiday comes up, you're losing their labor, right? Holiday. This is what they're asking for, a holiday. So chapter uh, five of Exodus, verse one. Afterwards, Moses and Aaron went to Pharaoh and said, thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, let my people go so that we may celebrate a festival to me in the wilderness. But Pharaoh said, who is this Yahweh that I should heed him and let Israel go? I don't know Yahweh and I don't want to let Israel go. And then they said, okay, the God of the Hebrews has revealed himself to us. Let us go three days journey into the wilderness to sacrifice to Yahweh. We're going to go take a, a week long festival. We're going to take a week, week off work, a vacation. And then verse four, the king of Egypt said to them, Moses and Aaron, why are you taking the people away from their work? Get to your labors. Pharaoh continued, now they are more numerous than the people of the land. So there's more of them than the Egyptians. And yet you want them to stop working. That's verse five. Guess what that word stop is in Hebrew? Shabbat. You want them to take a Shabbat? You want them to stop? No way. We're gonna lose too much of our, of our, of our effort and our time, right? Their productivity is all that matters. It doesn't matter who they are, where they come from, what God they've talked to, who cares? Their productivity is all that matters. Uh, we can also actually, another place to look to this is like Exodus 16, the manna story, where the people have just come out of Egypt, right? And they're told like, you have to keep producing all the time. And God has tried to tell them, you don't have to do that anymore, but they don't get it. They're like, we're in the wilderness there's no food here. There's no water. What are we going to get the water from? Guys, I'm going to give it to you. And they freak out. And then God goes, no, okay, I'm going to make the manna for you, right? I'll put this crazy stuff out there. And I want you to take a break every week and not do the work. Not even pick up the manna. I'll just, there'll be enough for you. Just trust that there'll be enough. The people have to trust that they can stop and that there will be enough. And that's, again, a story about the Sabbath. 
They're stopping, they're ceasing from their labors and trusting that God will have enough for them. But remember, some of them don't believe it and they keep going out and collecting, but then it turns to rot. So this is about trusting God, that there will be enough, that actually you aren't defined by what you produce and other people around you aren't defined by what they produce. Um, this is all tied up with this idea of the image of God. We are in the image of God. God didn't sleep necessarily, whatever, but God rested and didn't just, I don't know, stare at a wall or something. Um, God enjoyed creation. God looked around and said, this is good. So the Sabbath isn't just about going to church or isn't just about stopping doing bad things or something. Uh, it, it's a day to stop the ceaseless cycle of productivity that defines who we are and to try to enjoy something that's not you and that's not your labors, something that you didn't do. And that enjoyment of actually kind of letting go of our own productivity and actually letting go of even like consuming a lot of things, just trying to take something in that we don't control, that we don't own. In nature, right? Creation itself is a great example of this. So uh, here I've got Van Gogh showing some peasants at rest, right? Um, but this idea is that everyone deserves this. Every laborer, every person who's ever lived deserves this. And as we'll see, even the animals and the, the ground deserves this. So one of those things we might say is, uh, you know, we, we can sit back and kind of reflect on creation, right? Uh, and this isn't just a waste of time, just looking at a sunset. And we don't have to commodify it. We don't have to post it on Instagram. We don't have to uh, like feel guilty about it. We don't have to justify it. That in fact, being a part of the world and letting go for a minute and just being is not just a thing you can do. It's actually what God asks you to do. It's commanded in the Ten Commandments. All right, so uh, another big part of the story is Genesis 12. Uh, so the, the, the world is created. The things go wrong, as we all know. Uh, God tries to fix the world a few different ways, but God settles on one big plan. And that big plan is calling Abraham and Sarah to go and start a new family, start a new culture uh, in which God will work blessing and that God will eventually bless others. And they're being called, they're being called away or called to something different. And I want to say that this idea of calling isn't unique to Israel. Uh, the idea of many ancient cultures was that you were called to something, but you were called to serve the king. Uh, you were called, that's where you found your place in the world. Um, this is an image from Persepolis, which was uh, one of the capitals of the Persian empire, the largest empire in the world that had been known up to that point. This is an empire that defeated the Babylonians and took over uh, ancient uh, Israel, but also took over Babylon, where many of the Israelites were, the Judahites were, uh, and sent, this is King Cyrus sent them home, right? He sent the people home and let them rebuild the temple and so on. Uh, this is an image from the treasury at Persepolis. So this is inside the place where the king would take all of his wonderful treasures and the revenues, right? The tax revenues and everything would go inside this room. And this was the image that you'd see when you were bringing your, ta your tribute, right? All the produce of your labors that were going to keep the world stable. This is what you'd see. And on the top there, you can see at the very top, there's a king. I'll show you a little image of that. Uh, but then there's this giant like throne that he's sitting on. Here's the king. This would be Darius I, the Persian king. And underneath him, there's all these people. Notice they're all holding up the world. And these are this is a unique image in the for the ancient world because these are actually um, like anthropologically uh, detailed and carefully rendered images of actual people groups that were part of the Persian empire. So they, they like looked at people's hairstyles and they're like, okay, and what did their, their faces look like? What kind of clothes did they wear? They're all very specific. So the Persians were unusual because they cared about the people, they cared what they looked like, what they ate, kind of weapons they used, the people that they conquered so that they could be so proud of themselves. It's almost like um, the Royal Gardens, like Royal Gardens at Kew in the British Empire, like the, 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 the you know, British monarchy would like take plants from every place they conquered and put them in the 
like the botanical garden, so, so that you could like, this is what we conquered. Like this is the whole world in this one building, right? So here's this image, right? We have conquered this whole world. And this is where you find your joy. They're happy. And in fact, all of them, like the, you, can, you can hardly see it, but their fingers are kind of like lightly, like spryly carrying. It's so, it's so, this is where you fit. This just works, right? It's so great. And there's another image uh, in Persepolis where everyone's bringing their gifts from their own different like people groups, their own like places. And they're actually like, specific like these people made a jar like this and like they'd be giving this picture of a jar to the to the king um and everyone's happy it's a celebration this is what makes your life work if we compare that to this call the call to go and be a blessing a blessing to all the families of the earth it's a very different kind of call one of the things i'm going to say is that we are still being called by many different voices, by many different people. Every call, every voice that's calling you isn't just telling you to do something. They're giving you an identity, purpose. This is why you were made. Advertising is all about this. They don't just show you a cool car and like tell you the stats about the car. They, they try to make you want to become the person who would have that car. It's about, a, it's about an identity. And it's about a purpose. Why? Why, why would you? Why would you? Th this is what you're for. You're for this. There's so many voices calling us. God is calling us to do something quite different. And that calling is a calling to a covenant. So they're called to Sinai. And in Exodus 19, the people show up to Sinai, a desert a mountain in the middle of nowhere, uh, this crazy place. Um, and that's where God lives, apparently, out in the middle of nowhere. Um, we talk about that sometime. Why does God live in the middle of nowhere? Um, but nonetheless, they're called and then they're given a covenant. And I think I mentioned this last year, but just to reiterate, the covenant is so strange. Covenant just means a deal. Uh, everyone did business deals in the ancient world, but it also like when you got married, you signed a covenant in the ancient world, every culture, not just Israel. Um, when you bought a house, you'd sign a covenant. I mean, it's just, you know, it's, it means a contract. Uh, so you do contracts all the time uh, in the ancient world. And those were covenants. Uh, it wasn't a religious thing. No God that we know of in the ancient world ever made a contract or a covenant with a people except for Yahweh because it would be demeaning to the God. Gods don't sign contracts. They tell you what to do. They're sovereign, right? This God condescends, right? And this guy is like, all right, I'll sign a contract with you. I'm, I'm gonna make a covenant with you, a deal to make this relationship. This is why the prophets all talk about God and the people as like a marriage. Uh, it's because this is an actual marriage. Like it's a, this is what you do to get married, right? God has made this relationship with the people and God has, said, I, I want to be, be your buddy. I want to be your pal. And a big part of this is the covenant. Uh, sorry, is the Sabbath. So in uh, chapter 20, so chapter 19, God says, I want to make a covenant with y'all. First of all, I saved you so that we can have this covenant. God says in chapter 19, verse four, I saved you so that we can have this covenant. So salvation comes before the law, right? Salvation comes before the law. Grace comes before the law in Judaism, right? No Jew ever thought they got saved by, by, by law. No Jews ever said that. That's what Christians say, Jews say, but they don't. Uh, they say we got saved first so that we could be in this covenantal relationship with God. And then chapter 20, we get the 10 commandments, right? I'll get back to these in just a moment, but just to say the biggest of these, the one that gets the most airtime by far is the Sabbath. So the first four commandments are all about our relationship with God. I'm your God. Don't make any other gods before me. Don't make idols. Don't use my name in vain for no reason. And then remember the Sabbath day, fourth one, and keep it holy. And then after that, we shift to our relationship with our neighbors. So God, neighbors, and the pivot point is the Sabbath. And the Sabbath is the longest of these commandments. So the, the murder one just says, don't murder. <laughs> you shall not murder. The Sabbath one in chapter 20 of Exodus goes like this. Remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work. But the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. You shall do no work. You or your son or daughter, your male or female slave, your livestock, your alien resident in your towns. For in six days, the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that's in them, but rested or Shabbated on the seventh day. Therefore, the Lord blessed the Sabbath and consecrated it, made it holy. It's set aside because 
on that day, God stopped. And notice that's a reason that's given. So there's no reason given for why you shouldn't murder. It just says don't murder. It just says don't commit adultery. We should all know we shouldn't do these things. But it says it has to explain the Sabbath because it's a weird practice. And it explains it. You, you have to let everyone rest. Nobody has to be made to work on this day. Don't make your slaves work because they're not. I mean, like, why is there slavery in ancient Israel? It's wrong. It's bad. You know, the, we can talk about that later. But just to say, yeah, ancient Israel was a part of the ancient Near East and they had this practice, which over time they ended up realizing was despicable. But here, uh, they, God's working with them in a way that they understand. So God says, you have to let these people work. You can't make them work for you. They get the day off you do. Your animals get the day off. You can't even make them work for you. Everything gets a day off so that they can rest like God did. And notice it's creation itself. That's the reason that's given here. It's the created order. God, God has done this. Uh, so this idea that we're receiving this kind of law from God, really Torah, um, it really means more like instruction. God's trying to help us. God's giving us these instructions to try to help us become this new kind of people who's gonna bring blessing to all of the nations of the world. And a big part of this law is the fidelity, like the covenant that we are related to God and to each other. And we have to be loyal to, the, to, to God and to neighbor. Like we have to care about them. We have to take care of this relationship, but it is all about relationship. Now notice God saved us, not so we could do stuff. God didn't save us so we could produce things. God didn't save us so that we could save other people. God didn't save us so that we can fix the planet. That's not the purpose. Those are all good things, but God didn't save us to do those things. God saved us to have a relationship with us. And that's it. That's what God asks. Have like that's the that's the baseline. That's why God did this. Why did God go to all these elaborate lengths to try to bring blessing to the nations of the world? So that God could know you. And when do you think God has set aside some time for us to try to make sure we prioritize that relationship? Well, it's this day of the Sabbath. This is the day that God looks around and hangs out and checks stuff out and says, well, that's good. God does that every day, but the Sabbath is a special day for this this building and maintaining of relationship. And then community with each other. It's a time for our relationship with each other and making sure that every single person in our community has the ability to take this time. Now, I know in our secular modern world, this is really strange and different and it's, you can't just not have stores open on Sundays anymore, right? But how do we think about implementing this today? That's a big question. And it's a question we have to wrestle with. But it's not a question we can just say, well, it's complicated, so we don't care. This is the foundational aspect of our faith. This is why God got, got, got involved in all this to begin with, to have a relationship. That's why God created the universe. As James Weldon Johnson said, God said, I'm lonely. I'll make me a world. All right. So these 10 commandments, right? Really 10 words. The word commandment actually isn't in uh, anything referring to these in the Old Testament. The 10 words, the 10 things, the 10 sayings uh, is actually the word that's used, the 10 words, the 10 phrases. Um, so just thinking about these as ways for us to relate to God. Now, interesting thing here, most of the 10 commandments are the same when they're given in Exodus and then they're retold in Deuteronomy. When the people are about to come into the land, Moses tells them the 10 commandments again. Here, turn to Deuteronomy 5. Oh, I gotta stop, sorry. Uh, so yeah, Deuteronomy 5, all right. Moses changes the Ten Commandments. Did you know that? So Moses actually gives them a new Ten Commandments. Most of the things are the same, but there is one big difference. There's a couple of little differences, but there's one big difference. Chapter 5 of Deuteronomy, verse 12. Observe the Sabbath day, keep it holy. And this observe, it's the word watch. Watch. I'm going to come back to this. Watch. Watch that Sabbath day and keep it holy as the Lord your God commanded you. Six days you shall labor and do your work, but the seventh is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. Don't do any work and nobody, male or female slaves, your daughters, your sons, your donkeys, nothing, nothing works so that your male and female slave may rest as well as you. It's acknowledging that there are is slavery in, the, in, in, in Israel, but it's saying you have to make sure that the, it's so that the Sabbath is so that they can rest too. Remember that you 
were a slave in the land of Egypt. And the Lord your God brought you out with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm. Therefore, the Lord your God has commanded you to keep the Sabbath day. This is a little different. Exodus said it was all about creation. But in Deuteronomy, there's a different twist to it. It's pointing out social injustice. And it's saying, this is actually a way for us to mark it and to notice it and to try to give rest to even those people we might overlook or we might not want to give rest to because our comfort depends upon it. Everyone gets the rest because there was injustice in Egypt. Now, you might take the extension here and say, well, why, why would they have slaves at all? Because they didn't like that and they didn't think Pharaoh was being nice to them. Deuteronomy ends up later on having a law that says, if there is a slave who wants to leave their service, you have to just let them go. It's not manumission. It's not, it's not, it's not abolition of slavery or anything like that, but it's, it's a big loophole. <laughs> I'll say that. Uh, and this ends up becoming uh, a basis for uh, within the Jewish people questioning uh, the justice aspect of uh, enslavement in, in, in general. So that is to say, this idea of making sure that the weak and vulnerable in our community, here's Pharaoh tying up some, some weak people and, and uh, enslaving them. This is an image that Pharaoh made, uh, Pharaoh Ramses made about of trying to enslave folks. To He captured them and they made them go to work for him. Well, actually, we are supposed to notice, to observe this kind of injustice and then actually try to do something about it. Uh, also, the land in, in Leviticus, it says, let the land rest even. This is in Leviticus 25. And this time of jubilee, it's like a Sabbath. It happens every seven times seven years. There has to be this kind of like extra special day of making sure that everything rests. And you have to like give liberation to people who are enslaved. You have to like get, let all debts go. It's this kind of like renewal period for everything in life. So this commissioning and covenant is really all about kind of form of people who end up focusing on their own relationships with each other, but also their relationship with God, that, that those relationships become central. And also the, the, the Bible talks a lot about culmination, right? In the end, we hear these stories about a future day that will come, the end. And a lot of this stuff that we hear in the Old Testament and the New ends up sounding like we're just kind of hanging out with God, singing songs. And I, my son said, is, is that going to be boring? And I said, well, I mean, if it's infinite beauty that you're hanging out with, then maybe not, right? <laughs> but that is to say this idea that this like culmination is in a way this like intensification and like lack of mediation of, a, of this relationship with God. This is what the whole point of this stuff is. And so when Jesus ends up talking about the Sabbath, right? It's like these questions about like, well, should we do this in the Sabbath? Should we do that? Remember, Jesus breaks these Sabbath laws oftentimes because he's trying to like help someone. He's trying to, like lean in to someone's pain, someone's disability in the instance of the withered hand, right? He's trying to help someone regain their capacity. Uh, we think about the Sabbath as maybe a day of recreation, but recreation, re recreation is the word. Re recreation, re recreate. Like Jesus is like recreating on the Sabbath. And he says, isn't this what we're supposed to do? To actually, he's leaning into the Deuteronomy 5 aspect of the Sabbath commandment. So we end up looking at the Sabbath and we think, um, well, again, a day for blue laws, or it's a weird Jewish thing, I've heard some people say. Um, uh, I think actually uh, we need to prioritize our sense of Sabbath. Now, it's a modern world we live in. Some of us work on Sundays, uh, some of us have travel soccer for whatever, you know, like there's like, our kids, whatever, you know, there's all kinds of stuff that happens now on Sunday. Does it have to be Sunday? Well, it wasn't Sunday in the ancient world, right? Um, uh, that is to say, we are in some way in control of when this happens. None of us are doing this on Saturday, uh, you know, religiously uh, as, as happened in the, in the Old Testament period. Uh, Jews today uh, make this Saturday, but I have, Two suggestions. One is um, thinking about this as a day when we do stop work. Um, and second is thinking about this as a day when we do think about our relationship with God and with our neighbor. So part of the like digital Sabbath stuff, I've seen some people be like, you know, I'm just going to like not be on my email for a day, which is great. I recommend. Um, but if you're just doing this by yourself, that's actually missing a chunk. So how would covenant Think about communally having a period of rest 
of reflection, of time with creation, and of time of caring about the other. So one thing is focus and attention is tough today. I know. Uh, we live in a world where literally the attention economy has been designed to try to take away our attention. There are this thing, which I use and I hate, and, I, and, it's, and it's so helpful. Um, this thing is weaponized. It has been designed to try to trap you and literally get as much of your attention as possible. This is a uh, help for so many of us, uh, but it, this is an enemy too. We need to realize that uh, it's not just our phones. Everything is designed to capture your attention and your focus, right? And so even we think about like what we're supposed to be doing, like, uh, I mean, I'm distracted by my phone, but I'm supposed to be doing all this stuff and getting all this stuff done. Um, there's this whole other world out there, right? And that's not just either distracted or doing your work, but it's um, the the focused work of relaxing and resting and connecting with God and with neighbor, right? Uh, like this deserves some of our attention too. Uh, yeah, I'm gonna skip that, Never mind. Um, but I wanna end with this. So Simone Veit, uh, French uh, kind of mystic, uh, theologian-ish, um, uh, wonderful thinker, I think, uh, somebody who um, died very young, uh, but had a lot of amazing things to say. Uh, she has this uh, essay, about attention and the love of God. And she says, we often think in our, and she's writing in the 1940s, right? So, but, 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 you know, we often think in our contemporary culture about focus and attention being the opposite of distraction. And we think about kind of white knuckling or like muscling our way to be focused, right? I got to get this thing done. I got to focus. I got to not look at my phone. I got to like drink more coffee so I can like do this, right? We have two states, distracted and kind of zoned out or like focused and productive. That's, those are the opposites. And she says, no, the opposite, right? The opposite of attention is not distraction. The opposite of attention is willfulness. Willfulness. If you walk into a conversation with someone else and you think you know everything about them already and you don't actually pay attention to them, and you tell them everything you want about yourself and don't really listen to them, you're imposing your will on them. Like you, you, if you walk into nature and well, like a beautiful day uh, in the mountains and all you think is like, uh, I want to, I want to sell this or I want to buy this land or I want to, I want, you know, I, I'm, I'm going to impose my will on this thing. Or is it even, is this fun for me? Am I having fun right now? Am I, am I getting fun out of this? Or am I, am I relaxing? Am I getting enough relaxation? So many people today are starting to think the Sabbath is a cool thing because it would make you more productive or it might make you like, like better the next day at work, right? Uh, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna like get more out of this, right? I'm just gonna like up my productivity in the end, right? Um, that's again, willfulness. Like we are using this for ourselves. This is about me in some way. And she says the opposite of that is true attention. It's not white knuckling, focusing, finishing a paper or finishing a, like a job or like an email for work or something like that. You know, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get this thing done or uh, no, actual attention is when you subtract yourself in a way from the situation and you get your will, your willfulness kind of out of the way and you actually see things. So when you have a conversation with someone and you're not thinking about what you look like the whole time or what they're thinking of you or what you can get out of this or if they're gonna, right? Like you disappear when you're truly attentive. Uh, there, there's uh, studies that show like there's kind of two ways of thinking about attention or focus. One is on um, uh, the, the, the flashlight, like the laser beam, right? Like I'm gonna like focus on this uh, assignment and get it done. I'm gonna focus on this this project and get it done, whatever. That That's that you know, muscular, what Simone Weil called it, muscular attention. I'm going to do this thing. She says the opposite of that, this, that's, that's not really focused. Like the opposite is this, like being actually aware of the world, kind of like a kid. Jesus said the children are really the ones who understand the kingdom of God, um, in part because they don't care about themselves that much, right? They, they walk into a situation, they're, they're not paying attention to how loud they are or what they smell like, or they, you know, they're, they're just, they're immersed in the world. And they are often immersed in relationships in ways that we find it hard to be immersed in. They're even immersed in things like TV shows and movies in ways that we find hard to be immersed in these days, right? So that is to say, they are relaxed. <laughs> and they might not make us relaxed, uh, little kids. Um, 
But just to say that this non-being is kind of what Simone Weil is talking about, this openness to the world, fundamental radical openness to the world. And here's a quote from her. To attend, to have attention, means not to seek, but to wait. Not to concentrate, but to dilate our minds. It's almost a miracle, she says. And it's fundamentally, her argument is to, to wait for God. We are waiting for God to appear in the midst of people we know, situations, nature. Uh, ultimately, it's an attention and a waiting for God. And to come back to Deuteronomy at the end, observe, observe the Sabbath day. Observe the Sabbath day. That word is watch. What kind of watching and waiting are we doing? What kind of waiting and watching are we doing? Expectant that God might show up, not in ways we can control, we can plan for, we can optimize, we can, can, we can kind of, uh, I don't know, in some way wrangle God into showing up. But maybe, maybe in the midst of time that we set aside, we might encounter God and our neighbor. All right, that's my argument for Shabbat. Uh, and if you do have a chance to go to a Shabbat service or like a reformed synagogue Friday night, they do this beautiful ceremony where you're singing songs. And then there's this one moment where you turn to the door and the door opens and you sing a song of welcoming in the Shabbat. And then after that, you turn back around and you hear the Torah reading. But that's to say, there's this moment of welcoming in the Shabbat. Are there rituals that we could have to try to, create in us a ritual of attending, of waiting. I'll leave it there. Thanks. Sorry. Sorry, I went way too long. Thank you. Um, thank you, Dr. Breed. My, I have lots of messy notes, just like um, I was in the classroom at CTS. Um, we are out of time for questions, right. but what I'd like to do, I think Nikki's collected a couple, and if you'll collect some others that are around Nikki, that would be great. And we'll hand those to you, Dr. Yes. Reed, for you to have. And well, um, maybe can... we can incorporate a time to have you respond to those either, yeah. you know, or some I, other way. I could, I could record something if folks would want. Yeah. I'll, yeah, we can maybe I'll send that out. So if you have questions, write those down and we'll um, find a way to get you some, some answers. Um, we, in the coming week, so we've got a couple weeks where we're going to focus and, and um, focus is probably the wrong word for me to use. Um, hey, we got to do, we got to do it sometimes. Where we are going to we gotta do it. wait. Yeah, um, it has to happen. And, and see what experiencing Sabbath might look like in our own lives. Um, and we're going to do that in a little bit of a different way. Um, so later in July, we're not going to sit and study Sabbath. We are going to offer a space for you to um, not... Um, consume knowledge and material, but a place for you to open yourself to how God might meet you in a moment of stillness. So we are going to have two labyrinths on campus. Um, a labyrinth is a, an ancient spiritual practice. Um, there will be one in here um, in the fellowship hall and a more family-friendly one over in the education wing. There will be some information about that coming out um, in Windows on Covenant. And I encourage you, if today spoke to you, um, or if you're curious about what um, embracing and welcoming Sabbath into your life um, more intentionally might look like, I encourage you to come either Sunday, July 14th or Sunday, July 21st um, to walk the labyrinth and see what might um, pop up for you not as something to be um, fueling you for more productivity, but something that might um, fuel your faith a little bit more. Um, Dr. Breed will be back with us on Sunday, July 28th. So we'll meet in here and we'll um, look forward to that time. I hope you'll all be here. Um, so thank you for being with us this morning. We have worship at 11 o'clock. I hope you'll join us for that too. And I imagine Dr. Breed will linger a tiny bit if anybody wants to speak. So thank you again um, and go in peace.